These Nile saltwater croc hybrids could help prove crocodilians question basic biology and our understanding of evolution, but it's likely not the way you think. For how they question our understanding of biology, crocodilian hybrids disprove the very concept of what a species is. If you took any basic biology class, you were most likely taught that a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Take a female tiger and a male lion for instance. If they breed, they make ligers, but a male and female liger can't produce their own offspring together. Crocodilians, however, don't follow this definition at all. Several examples of hybridization are apparent within crocodilians, especially within the genus Crocodilus, or the true crocodiles. A recent example is the hybridization between a Nile and Solar crocodile, two of the largest species of crocodiles alive today. Not only can hybridization occur within crocodilians, some of these species have been proven to produce fertile offspring. An example of this was documented in 1994, as there was breeding between Crocodilus siamensis with a chromosome number 2n equals 30 and Crocodilus porosus with a chromosome number 2n equals 34. The authors found that Crocodilus siamensis and Crocodilus porosus produced F1 hybrids with 2n equals 32, and F2 offspring with again 2n equals 32. This suggested hybrid viability, although there were different chromosome numbers in the parental generation. Although most of these hybrids are found in captivity, hybridization can and does occur in the wild. The most commonly talked about example for conservationists is the hybridization between the American crocodile and the critically endangered Cuban crocodile. Due to man-made modifications in their habitats, American crocodiles are now regularly breeding with Cuban crocodiles, which is diluting the genetic purity of Cuban crocodile populations, making it a factor leading to their extinction. The hybrids that are producing their own offspring seem to be hybrids of crocodiles within the same general regions like the Americas, Africa, and the Indo-Pacific. I haven't found any evidence yet that Nile salty hybrids are fertile, but I do know of a triple hybrid that exists of two Indo-Pacific species and an American species, this being a Siamese salty and Cuban mix. Hybridization is just one of many reasons why in all honesty, there is no concrete definition of what a species is. One paper about crocodilians even stated, one could kill a large number of systematists by locking them in a room and saying, no one gets out until you all agree on what a species is. They are likely to die before they agree. This then extends into the debate of using morphological versus genetic evidence for classifying organisms. For the longest time, the way we identified a species was through physical characteristics or morphological evidence. But by the 21st century, we were able to look at the genetics of animals in ways we never could. Now we could see on a genetic level just how closely related organisms were. For crocodilians, this opened up a can of worms because new species were being discovered. What was once considered one species was now considered two or even three distinct species. Even if physical characteristics were long suspected, the genetics confirmed the arguments for new species to be recognized. But this new method of classification has led to debates about what should be considered more valid, genetic or morphological evidence. One recent example of this is the Rio Apoporus caiman, a subspecies of the spectacled caiman, which was rediscovered by Sergio Balaguerra Arena and his team in 2018. What makes this caiman unique is its long, slender snout, which is very thin compared to the other known caiman species. A study in 2015 looked at the differences between caiman skulls and came to the conclusion that the Rio Apoporus caiman could be its own separate species from the spectacled caiman. However, when Sergio released his research on the caiman in 2019, a different answer was brought up. Based on the genetic work done in the study, not only was it argued that the Rio Epiporus caiman should remain a subspecies, it was stated that it was genetically similar or the same with another subspecies of spectacled caiman, Caiman crocodilus crocodilus. Forrest Galante, who looked for more of this caiman species after Sergio's expedition, claimed to have found evidence that the caiman may be a separate species, but I haven't seen this followed up on. This debate has even led scientists to question our understanding of evolution. It's all thanks to this crocodilian right here. But before I get into that argument, let me put down a claim that is often said to debunk evolution. Crocodilians are said to be living fossils, which means they have changed very little since their lineage began during the age of dinosaurs. Because the fossil record contains animals millions of years ago that looked similar to the crocodilians of today, they disprove the notion that animals change over time. However, the statement of crocodilians being living fossils is entirely wrong. The first crocodile-like reptiles, or crocodilomorphs, emerged in the late Triassic, and they were actually small land-based animals. Take Terrestrosuchus, for example, a creature that looks almost nothing like the reptiles of today, 
yet it is one of the first animals in this lineage. By the time of the Jurassic, crocodile morphs began to truly diversify. While animals that would share a similar body plan to existing crocodilians began to show up, crocodile morphs would take on many different forms. Some became fully aquatic and had flippers along with reduced osteoderms. Others stayed on land and developed unique adaptations such as armor that resemble an armadillo. Diets also ranged and we had crocs that were carnivores, herbivores, and omnivores. One of these animals didn't even look remotely like crocodilians. Cymosuchus, also known as pug croc, was a terrestrial herbivore and as you can tell, it shares very few obvious features with the crocodilians of today. Even after the KPG mass extinction event, there was still a decent diversity within the modern order Crocodilia. Some of them were believed to be arboreal, some stayed on land and had hoof-like appendages, and some of the semi-aquatic ones even had strange-looking snouts. This notion of crocodilians being living fossils started mainly because paleontologists in the past didn't have many fossils to work with, and the fossils they did have looked like the animals of today. But once more fossils were found, a greater understanding of the crocodilian lineage was exposed. With that discussed, how does this animal here question our understanding of evolution? This is the Temistema, an endangered species and considered one of the largest crocodilians alive today. This crocodilian was long believed to be in the crocodile family, Crocodilidae, and this was based on morphological evidence. However, by the 1980s, there was some debate surrounding the taxonomic placement of the Temistema. Based on genetic information, it seemed that Temistema was actually part of the Gario family, Gavialidae. Since this was proposed in the 80s, a long and never-ending debate concerning the Temistema and Gario relationship has endured. As was stated, the overall morphological evidence has long led to the conclusion that Temistema are in Crocodilidae. The Temistema and Gario differ in their tail and jaw musculature, their ontogenetic trajectories and their skulls differ, and there are differences in their skull structures. Another thing to note is that while Indian gharial have a very fish-heavy diet, Temistema have a more varied diet. While Indian gharial are fine eating almost exclusively fish, if a Temistema is fed this way, it'll die from lack of nutrients. This was actually discovered due to zoos in the past thinking the Temistema was like the gharial, believing both fed on fish. This then led to Temistema in captivity dying, making this a legitimate difference to know about. As for the genetic evidence, there are similarities between the Temistema and Indian Gharial in their DNA sequences as well as their immunological responses. Some slight physical characteristics are brought up too. One study in 2021 claimed to have found slight similarities in the skulls of the two species, but stated they were using new skull characteristics for the paper. Another interesting discovery was that the Temistema and Gharial were the only crocodilians to have the ability to exclusively change the color of their ventral scales. If this debate about morphological versus genetic evidence wasn't already confusing, this debate screws up the timeline of crocodilian evolution. Through the use of the fossil record, the Temistema is in the family Crocodilidae, and the Gharial lineage is old, diverging in the late Cretaceous. These early Gharial relatives in the Cretaceous are called Thoracosaurs, a group of also slender-snouted animals. However, through the use of genetics, the timeline looks much different. The genetic timeline presents evidence that not only is the Temistema and Gavialidae, the Gharial lineage is much younger. In this timeline, the Thoracosaurs I mentioned are also not part of the Gharial's lineage. With the Gharial's lineage younger, it's suspected that the last common ancestor of the Indian Gharial in the Temistema was only about 31 to 16 million years ago, not nearly as long as what the fossil evidence states. There is even some thought that the Thoracosaurs are not even part of the order Crocodilia, but that's another discussion. However, this debate could be leading to the genetic conclusion for the Temistema. An extinct species of crocodilian called Hanusuchus was recently discovered. And in a study from 2022, it was stated that due to the species having similar features to both the Temistema and Indian Gharial, it could provide crucial evidence for ending this debate. No matter what the answer is, I think Colin Stevenson of the Temistema Task Force said it best. This is an interesting debate and perhaps emphasizes the blurring of the species concept and the fact that it is difficult to place nature within distinct boxes. Also, these Nile Salty hybrids will be discussed in a later video, along with some other gigantic hybrids. Be on the lookout for that video. And I'm also looking forward to making some videos about these two confirmed 20-footers. I also want to announce that due to the very recent death of Cassius, the world's longest purebred crocodile in captivity, a video will be made about this crocodile and his life. 
learn more about the animals you just saw by my book, What We Get Wrong About Crocodilians. It examines claims of giant crocodiles, a World War II massacre, their regenerating tails, alligators and sewers, their record land speeds, and more. The book looks at a variety of subjects many people, including experts, get wrong about these animals, and I desperately wanted to dispel the myths that have persisted so long. Buy What We Get Wrong About Crocodilians in physical or digital formats. Link in bio, comments, or description to buy.